Amen. Well, as many of you know, my brother Paul and I wrote a book together on the end times. Um, one of the main features of the last days is a separation that's going to take place within the church. Um, we're talking about the parable being fulfilled of the tear, and we, you know, that was a kingdom parable. That's not, it has nothing to do with the world. It's, it is something that relates to the church, that there's going to be a separation within the church because there are tears within the church. And actually, this separation process is not complicated at all. It's actually very simple. It centers around loving the truth. Those who do not love the truth will buy something else. I was watching a very popular TV preacher here not too long ago, and he was assuring the audience that they were not going to go through the Great Tribulation, and they were clapping. Uh, I have never heard anybody clap when I was telling people they were going to go through the Great Tribulation, but <laughs> they were clapping. Uh, generally, the true message is not the popular one. I don't think they're clapping because they love a lie, but probably because they have never heard anything else, and that's the most comforting message, that all is well and you're not going to have to suffer. About 14 years into Hezekiah's reign, there was the imminent threat of an invasion. And the word of the Lord through the prophet was, stay in Jerusalem, don't leave, and I'll defend the city. And, you know, immediately all of the rebellious said no. Uh, they were looking for the last train out and it was a mass exodus out of the city. And you know, uh, the city was quite depleted, but evil followed them. And it's really just that simple. In the word of the Lord, the true message comes forth. The people that adhere to that message are preserved. The ones who don't, well, evil follows them, but that's how it works. Do you believe? Well, if we love the truth, then we're going to obey it. Because, you know, loving the truth isn't just loving an ideology, it's loving a person, the one who represents truth. And if we love him, we keep his commandments, we obey. Now, we have two extreme poles here when we consider God and Satan, because the Godhead is absolute truth, and everything about Satan represents a lie and falsehood. He's the one who deceiveth the whole earth. And so, we have another example here in Jeremiah's time, and we'll look at that in a little bit, but in Jeremiah's time, there are two distinct voices. One was a lie. One was promising peace and prosperity when they're on the brink of disaster. The other voice was saying, amend your ways and doings and I'll save you, I'll preserve you. Two distinct voices coming forth. And of course, the popular one was the peace and prosperity message. And um, you know, that one didn't work, did it? But even today, the world is becoming so deceitful. Uh, it's very difficult to trust anybody. It's, you get all kinds of phone calls, all kinds of scams, all kinds of uh, internet fraud. Phony IRS calls, anybody get any of those? Phony IRS calls, credit card calls, um, phony contributions especially from Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire. You know, they want to send you millions of dollars. I think I was averaging about 12 emails every week, and they all wanted to give me millions of dollars. Uh, 
In fact, even while I was here, I got a, a phone call. And uh, the voice said, uh, hello, Larry. And I said, uh, Larry or Harry, or I don't know what he was asking for. I said, no, I'm afraid you have the wrong number. Oh, uh, maybe you can help me. Click. <laughs> because I've, <laughs> I've had these calls before. You know, it's a scam. You know, oh, maybe you can help me. And then they go into some spiel. Click. I just hung up. I got a call from a, a credit card company here just recently, too. They wanted to, me to verify my information. <laughs> so uh, they said, uh, what's your birth date? And so I gave them a date. They said, uh, oh, that's not what we have here. Uh, I said, oh, I said, well, what do you have? And they said, oh, we're not allowed to, to give out that kind of information. <laughs> I, said, I said, well, if you can't give me that kind of information, I can't give you any either. So, uh, but, you know, as this age concludes, uh, we're going to see a great uh, separation or division. Those who love the truth polarize one direction, and those who love lies will polarize into another camp. It's going to be bigger than the schism in 1054, if you know your church history, anyway. But you know, Father God is called in a number of places, the God of truth. And Jesus Christ declared himself to be the truth. And the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. Some years ago, I was listening to a, a nuclear physicist on radio, and he made this statement I thought was very interesting. He said, uh, the most powerful force in the universe is truth. I thought that was pretty interesting for a, a nuclear phys physicist. But on the other, in the other corner, uh, you have the one who is called the father of lies, and of course, the false Christ, the one who's coming, he is a master deceiver. And the false prophet, he's a master of deceit as well. And so what we're going to see take place as this age concludes is a uh, yeah, battle between truth and error. That's why we want to love the truth. I mean, love the truth. And if we don't love the truth, then we're going to get something else. And remember, this separation is not from the world. It's not as though God's people are being separated from the world. The world is already in deception. In fact, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. I mean, the deception, they're already deceived. So we're talking about something that's going to take place within the church. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians for a minute. And here you have the Apostle Paul. He is telling us the purpose of the Antichrist and the separation that he's going to bring about. And we've heard all of this through this convention already. In fact, uh, this is nothing new, but I do feel as though God impressed me to speak this. So looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse, beginning in verse 9, uh, speaking of the Antichrist, it says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The wonders are real enough, but they're coming from the dark side. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God, capital G, shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So it is God who ordains the false prophet and the deceiver to gather out of the church all of those who do not love the truth. Very simple process here. 
That's why we want to embrace the truth, because if we don't, there is coming deception that is uh, unparalleled. And it's going to be hard to tell the difference unless you're really in tune. By the end of the first century, um, there were major heresies infiltrating the church. And, and just knowing that helps us to understand what the Apostle John was dealing with in his epistles, because he was dealing with a few major uh, um, sects there that were really taking their toll on the church. And uh, for example, I mean, you could probably find 30 or 40, I counted them up once, 30 or 40 instances where he is contrasting the two fields of truth and lie and light and darkness or truth and error. And so he defines these two fields very clearly because by the end of the first century, I mean, they were taking a toll on the church. By the end of the second century, according to the Bishop of Lyons, there were 218 major heresies going through the church, although I think some of his doctrines were a little bit flawed too. Um, but John's epistles delineate truth and error. If a man say he know God and does not keep his commandments, he's a liar. There's a lot of people today that say they know God and they love God that don't keep his commandments. John said, if a man say that he know God and does not keep his commandments, he's a liar. John is the only author who uses the word antichrist. In fact, he uses it five times in his little epistles there. Uh, but he's the only one, and he gives us a little insight into the last days. But again, the final battle is basically between truth and error. And so it's not just good enough to, it's not just good enough to love truth, but we want to hate error as well. You know, if you take a look at Psalm 119, it's a picture of the new covenant. And uh, here's, here's somebody who loves God's precepts. Uh, he loves God's ways. But you also notice that he hates every false way. So it's not just good enough to love righteousness. We want to hate wickedness as well. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. That was Christ. Ye that know, love the Lord hate evil. So you see a certain love-hate here in Psalm 119. You know, this is a new covenant. We want to love the ways of God, and we want to hate every false way. That's why we want to be espoused to the word of God. Amen? So here's the battle. Now, let me just give you seven brief little reasons why to love the truth. And number one, it's because Christ is the truth. He identified himself as the truth. So we're not just loving an ideology, we're loving a person. And number two, truth purges iniquity. It's like a sword that cuts to the quick. It convicts of sin uh, and righteousness. And so it's by uh, mercy and truth that iniquity is purged. And so truth, you know, exposes the, the, the flesh and the things that need to be cut out of our life. Amen? And truth also is a shield. It's a buckler against error. Psalm 91, 4. So it defends us. If we know the truth, then we're going to recognize the error. Also, truth sets us free. Amen? I think we can all attest to things in the past that bound us, and when the light hit us, we were liberated. I mean, we were like that in religion that we came out of. I mean, it's Christian religion, but very legalistic. But when we heard the truth, it set us, the truth it has set us free. And then truth uh, helps us to stand uprightly. 
I mean, Paul said to gird your loins with truth. It's to help us stand upright. Truth enables us to ride prosperously, as Pastor Mike was quoting that verse from Psalm 45. Ride prosperously because of truth, meekness, and righteousness. And then, of course, walking in truth will ensure us a, a good place in heaven. Amen? Now, I want to consider seven reasons why we should hate a lie, but before we do that, Let's look at John's Gospel, chapter 8, for a moment. John's Gospel, chapter 8. And Jesus is dealing with the hypocrites. And, uh, you know, there's a, a little verse that says, speaking lies in hypocrisy, but the better translation says, speaking lies through hypocrisy. In other words, pretending to be something that you're not. Speaking lies through a hypocritical life, pretending to be something that you're not. And this is what Jesus is dealing with here. In John 8, 44, he says to these hypocrites, he says, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So, good reason number one to hate a lie, because Satan is the father of lies. And his goal is to keep people from Christ and from salvation, that's his main goal. And he's a flatterer. Um, flattery, the purpose of flattery is to gain advantage. There's a hook there in flattery. And of course, the Antichrist is a flatterer too. Lies are to take people off course, to delude. Lies create a false concept like eternal security. Lies bind people, blind people. I mean, when you think of all of the religions in the world that have blinded the minds of people and bound them. I mean, every non-Christian religion is demonic and they bind people, they blind people. Lies rationalize, yea, hath God said. And they cause people to lose the crown. And lies ultimately put people in hell. Revelation 21.8. But that's the purpose of a lie, to deceive, to rob, to take advantage, to get revenge, to kill, to destroy. So why do people love lies? I mean, people love a message that justifies their sin. Or the thing that they want to do, or the thing that they don't want to do, or the thing that they don't want to change, or the thing that sounds good. And so they gravitate to those type of messages. I mean, lies comfort people who want to justify their actions. Do you know people like that? that people shop around and try to find somebody that can tell them what they want to hear. They can shop around, they can find a church that'll agree with anything that they want. And you know, the thing is, uh, as ministers, a lot of times they, they want to get the minister to justify what they're doing. And if the minister says it, they think, well, hey, I can, uh, the man of God told me this so I can blame him. Uh, but that's not gonna work. You know, people, literally hang their destiny on what the preacher says? I mean, that's Ecclesiastes. The, word, the words of the wise are like goads fastened. Uh, people hang their destiny on what the preacher says. I mean, this is a pastor's seminar, and I'll tell you what, um, 
I really wouldn't want to be in the place of some pastors because they're not telling them the truth. And they're just telling them something that sounds good. In Ezekiel 14, another good example, you have somebody who comes to the prophet and he's got the stumbling block of his iniquity in his heart. He's got something there that he wants justified. And so he comes to the prophet seeking a word and the Lord said, I will answer that man according to that stumbling block that's in his heart. I'll tell him exactly what he wants to hear. Now that's a judgment. When God tells people and allows somebody to hear something that's wrong just to justify their lifestyle, he's taking them out. You understand that? But, you know, you can't really blame it all on the man of God at the judgment. I mean, the minister's going to have to answer for what he told the people, but it's not going to get you off the hook either. You know, I was working on this message a few weeks ago and I got a letter from a minister that we've known for a number of years. It's a long letter and he was telling us how he's changing his doctrine on divorce and remarriage. Um, and he's seeking to take comfort He's listening to another voice, and he's seeking to take comfort in what he wanted to do. So, I mean, that's how it works. People that have known the truth, and then they listen to another voice, I mean, that's, that's a little bit more serious. There's a lot of people that have never heard a correct teaching on the last days or you know, the church being subjected to the tribulation. They've only heard, you know, the pre trib rapture. That's one thing. But somebody who has sat and under good teaching and then gone over to the other side, that's something else. But they're seeking to justify, you know, what they want to do. And that's why people love lies. I mean, lies can comfort. They can give false consolation, but... It's not going to work in the end. So here is Jeremiah, and this is what he's dealing with. He's dealing with prophets who are giving a, a message of peace and prosperity to a nation that is about ready to be judged. And the people loved that message. Now, the true message was amend your ways and your doings and get right with God. And the message of repentance was being pushed aside. The other message was very popular of peace and prosperity. You know, that's the message of the Antichrist, isn't it? And so, in Jeremiah chapter 5, Verse 31, you know, the truth hurts once in a while, but it, it, it salvages, it restores. People that really love us tell us the truth. You know, David said, let the righteous smite me. It'll be a healing oil that shall not break my head. The kisses of the enemy are deceit, <laughs> but the ones who really love us tell us the truth even if it hurts a little bit. I mean, we want to say things in a nice way, but it can hurt. And so Jeremiah said this in chapter 5, verse 31, the prophets prophesy falsely, the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. But what are you going to do in the end? You know, when the nation falls, when... All of their prophecies fail, and what are you going to do when you stand before God at the judgment? To What are you going to do in the end of the whole matter? But do you see this? They were contradicting the true message of amend your ways and your doings, 
And they were just saying everything's going to be well, and they were prophesying a peace and prosperity message. And here the nation is on the, the brink of destruction. So it was a message that the people love to hear. That's what they love to hear today. But there was an eminent threat here. They were, I mean, I'm drawing a parallel here because, you know, this is the state of the church today throughout the world. People are gravitating to a, a message uh, that makes them feel good, that tells them what they want to hear, that condones the lifestyle. And we've heard all that during the convention, but like I said, I got this message before the convention, so uh, you just have to take it as it is. But what will you do in the end thereof? So lies can give temporary relief, I guess. But we all have to stand before God in the end and give an account. So here's Jeremiah's day, message of peace and prosperity, very attractive. Here's the true prophet saying, but you need to amend your ways and your doings, and if you do, God will salvage you. See, they're taking refuge in a lie. There are so many messages going out there today that are imbalanced, they're not qualified. God loves you no matter what. God loves you in your sin. Uh, God will never judge the church. God loves his church. I heard a minister saying that so lustily. How dare anybody touch the church? God loves his bride. How dare anybody rebuke the church or deal with the church? You know, he's just giving him this, you know, this glossy little message of, you know, how dare anybody correct you? You know, you're all okay. God loves you. God understands your Frailty is your weakness. God will never allow his children to be lost. I'll tell you what, Abraham looked at a lot of his seed in hell. He looked across the great divide and he saw a lot of his children over on the other side and they were in hell. See, it's all very comforting except it's imbalanced and it's not true. But again, we're just leading up to the similarity between Jeremiah's day and today. So two voices were going forth. One was true, one was false, and the people preferred the one that was false, and that's generally the way it works. Solomon said, buy the truth. Oh, you have to pay a price. I think some of you have paid a little price for truth, haven't you? A little separation and I tell you what, you go to certain countries and you see where people have paid a great price for the truth. They're, they've been put out of their families and out of their homes and lost jobs and everything else. But here's a voice that's saying peace and prosperity and tolerance, um, acceptance of everything. I think when you have paid a price for something, you're not going to sell out. But here's people that don't love the truth. Now, here's another prophet that Jeremiah deals with in Jeremiah 28, 15. Sorry if this isn't the most uplifting message, but it happens to be the truth. So, um, I mean, this is the purpose of the false ministers coming in the last days. They're, they're to take the tares out of the church, people that aren't real, don't love the truth. Jeremiah 28, 15, and then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. You know, I again... When people hear the truth, and then they hear a lie, then they're going to make a choice. You know, it's just like a certain Bible school back a few years ago. Here's one message saying one thing, and another message is saying something else. And so the students are going to have to make a choice. Which one are we going to believe here? 
You know, if you love truth, somehow you gravitate to the right message. It's God's grace, but I mean, if you really want the truth, even if it hurts, you're going to listen to the right voice and say that there's a, I can identify with that. There's a true ring here. And, you know, other situations, you might not know, but there's something that just doesn't ring about that. People, evangelists, ministries that just don't, there's something that just doesn't quite ring here. My brother Paul and I, we were watching a, a minister on television some years ago. It's in New York City. And he was doing all kinds of miracles and, and just the way he was talking. And my brother Paul and I are just kind of looking at each other and kind of shaking our heads and we're saying, no, this guy isn't real. And then later that week, we saw in the newspaper where this man was arrested for arson. He had burned down a lot of houses, you know, to collect the money. But, you know, there, there's something that just doesn't quite ring about people that are not true. If you love the truth, there's something that just doesn't click. It's like a sixth sense that, that God has given to us. Do you believe that? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you meet people all the time and you wonder... Uh, but there's a heart issue when somebody hears the truth and they choose the other side, the false. Here's another verse in Hosea 10, 13. Uh, Hosea says, you've eaten the fruit of lies. So here's people that sit in church, you know, they, they're listening to a message that's er erroneous and but it's, it's palatable. I mean, here's something that's sweet to them. Here's a fruit that they like to hear. They're, they're enjoying this. You've eat, eaten the fruit of lies. It makes them feel good. So the prophets in Jeremiah's time were saying, God will never destroy the temple. God loves his church. God loves the temple. God will never touch it. Jeremiah said, well... Okay, we'll go to Shiloh and see what God did there. <laughs> he allowed that place to go down. But let's get into Jeremiah 7 for a minute. <clears throat> this is God's dwelling place. God will never touch the temple. But we know that God did touch the temple, don't we? I mean, it was raised to the very foundation. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 3. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, are these. For if ye truly amend your ways and your doings, if ye truly execute judgment between a man and and his neighbor. Verse 7, Then will I cause you to dwell in this place. Verse 8, Behold, you trust in lying words. Verse 9, Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely? And verse 10, And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We're delivered to do all these abominations. Now, here is the true false grace message uh, we're free to do all these things no condemnation we've been forgiven past present and future um, you know we're free to do all these things will you come and stand in my house and and commit all these things and say well you know it's okay is there a familiar ring to this we're free to do all these things, no condemnation. So here's a true voice and here's a false voice. And the one that they were listening to, of course, was, for the most part, was the wrong voice. Let's look at Jeremiah 6 for a minute. Jeremiah 6 and verse 14. And they're promoting a false security. Um, 
Jeremiah 6, 14, it says, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And this verse is actually uh, quoted a few times. Um, but they were saying peace when there was no peace. But I think we're getting the picture here, right? I mean, there have always been false teachers, false preachers, but we're coming into a time that's going to be unprecedented and to the place where if it was possible, even those that were written in the book of life could be deceived. I mean, the deception will be so great. That is why we have to love the truth. And if we love the truth, then we obey it. I mean, people do not, you know, people say, oh, yeah, we love Christ, we love, but don't keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. So those who are not true will follow the lie. So here's the battle of the ages between truth and error. You know, I was listening to a, a minister from Australia has a big work, contemporary worship, big attraction. A lot of people try to imitate, you know, the church there. He has thousands of young people, but it's strange fire. It's, uh, and you know, here, it's, it's a hard thing to deal with because, you know, here's a church with thousands of youth and they look at you and they say, well, what are you doing? You know, where's your youth? And here's thousands of young people, you know. This uh, pastor was being interviewed about homosexuality and um, why he didn't condemn it. And he said, uh, well, Jesus never condemned homosexuality. And apparently he has never read the book of Revelation <laughs> uh, because it was the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who gave the revelation to John. And he said, these people go to hell. But I mean, you see what's happening? <laughs> That's why we need revival so desperately. So it's the unrighteous who love lies and they become more and more unrighteous. Those who love the truth become more and more righteous. Okay, uh, last couple of verses here. Let's go to Revelation chapter 22. Verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Oh, liars. Liars do not go to heaven. I remember a little story was Ann Jimenez, some of you might know her. And she was telling how she was preaching to a big congregation about lying. And uh, she says she couldn't believe what happened at the end of the service. Almost the whole congregation came down to repent. Um, you know, I don't know, I guess we grew up a little bit different. I always thought when you became a Christian, you just didn't do certain things. But it's a different story today. I mean, people commit all kinds of thins, sins and they think it's okay. But Jesus said, these people do not enter into the gates of the city. So the key to writing prosperously 
as it says in Psalm 45, is by truth and meekness and righteousness. We want to ride prosperously through life, then we have to love the truth. Sometimes it hurts, but it saves us from death. We want to choose life. You know, Paul said, speaking lies through hypocrisy, living a double life. Um, maybe they don't come out and lie, but their lives, their life is, they're play acting. You know, they're in church. These are the kind of people that are going to be purged out of the church. All the hypocrites in Zion go at the end. You know, we want the distortion out of our lives. Everything that constitutes a lie or a distortion to go. I was reading some statistics about refining gold and I mean, there's intense heat that refines gold. It's like um, between 1,100, 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. But to produce fine glass is like 3,600 degrees <laughs> Fahrenheit. Uh, you know, we're talking about glass getting the distortion, the untruth out of our being. And it seems as though it's far more intense <laughs> um, to have the distortion removed from us. Because, you know, when you take a look into Scripture, there's a little hypocrisy and even some of the best people. You know, like Peter. <laughs> uh, you know, Paul had to deal with Peter. I mean, he was a little hypocritical. Um, and... Uh, you know, Paul says, let your love be without dissimulation or hypocrisy. But Lord, may all the distortion be removed from us. Anything that makes a lie. All of those on Mount Zion, there's no guile in their lips. They're absolutely pure. I appreciated the, the message here about those who attain unto Mount Zion, I was reminding my, my little brother down there that, you know, there's a nice parallel between Psalm 24 and Revelation 14. Because in Psalm 24, there are four qualifications to get up the hill. And then in Revelation 14, those on the hill have these qualities. If you take a look, if you match them up, there's a nice little parallel there. You know, they're all pure, no deceit in their lips. They, uh, they're innocent. Um, they're without fault. Um, and in order to follow Christ, you have to have, you know, the vanities, the idols removed. You can't be in the world and follow Christ with all your heart. But you see a beautiful parallel between Psalm 24, the four qualities, you know, things that you need to come up the hill. And then you see that in Revelation 14, all of these characters, characteristics in those who come up. But uh, anyway, that's all I have to share. Um, but again, may God help us to, to love the truth. Because, I mean, it's a very simple process. And you see it throughout Scripture, how that here's a true message, here's a false message. And even in times of crisis, um, in fact, even when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, there was a true message there to flee to the hills of Pella. All of those who fled were preserved. The ones who stayed in Jerusalem were destroyed. Here's another scene where it was the reverse of it. <laughs> you know, you see in one scene, it's surrender. In the next scene, uh, the Lord says, stay in Jerusalem. Um, but we need to be attentive to what God is saying in this hour and obey the truth, and that will preserve us by his grace. Amen. So, Father God, we just thank you.
for your presence and for the, the confirmation throughout this convention. Lord, you want a people that are going to follow you, um, that are going to be faultless, that are going to be without deceit. And we, we feel, Lord, that uh, may we fill the, the bill by your grace, in Jesus' name. Lord, cleanse us from all the deceit and lies and hypocrisy in our own lives so that we can be crystal clear. In Jesus' name, let us love the truth and let us hate every false way. By your grace, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.